Great, and and looks like we are live from the MIT Media Lab. Um, welcome everybody uh, in the room and up there in internet land, and all those of you who will be observing this video in the future as part of our curriculum and uh, at legal hackathons and, and other venues. Welcome to the first kickoff talk of the new MIT Computational Law Lecture Series. And really, we couldn't have lucked out with a better speaker than Jason R. Barron, who has been a pioneer, as I'm sure many of you know in the room, in the area of the burgeoning area of e-discovery, which um, at least in my group, the human dynamics group, as you see some fellow researchers here from that, uh, where we do big data and applied analytics. Um, this area of e-discovery is thought of as the part of the law that has really been first to adopt and adapt, and really embrace and apply the new science of data, um, the, this emerging discipline of um, computational social science, you could say, um, you know, um, within um, economics and certainly within um, marketing and within healthcare, um, there's an emergence of the use of computational data science as opposed to, let's say, any Thing that's quantitative and analytic. Uh, you know, when I was in college, uh, we certainly did surveys and did you know, regression analyses. You know, quantitative is not new. Something is new with data science: the application of um, the the application of re repeatable patterns uh, that are themselves um, based upon models, which are um, discerned uh, from the data, as opposed to models that we come up with, like say a model of a rational economic actor or a model in psychology of an id and superego, or other models um, of a ordinary reasonable person, perhaps, within the law, for example. There are many models that drive different um, fields of practice that have corresponding social science um, um, academic overlays. In data science, I've noted one of the things that's different, and different in my group, <clears throat> is that we frequently derive the models from the data. Professor Sandy Pentland, um, who runs our group, um, calls that reality mining. Um, and we've gotten extremely good results in terms of its descriptive power um, of, uh, of the phenomena, whether it's economic or social um, or other otherwise behavioral, uh, and also its predictive power. And so as uh, I must admit, I am uh, from a background that's commercial and transactional, and also uh, to some extent um, I suppose legislative. Uh, that was my area of practice when I was in the law. Um, and uh, hacky, maybe interested in creating tools and technologies. It would be a bad day for me if I were involved in litigation. Nonetheless, litigation is the first thing everybody here thinks of and asks me about at MIT when they want to know what is computational law and what is happening at law.mit.edu. So it's with a great um, Great anticipation and great um, pleasure that I'd like to introduce Jason Barron to provide a uh, talk about the path to um, the emerging field of e-discovery and to fill in some gaps and connect some dots for all of us who are not familiar with the current state of the art and tell the story of how we got here and then to give us a look on the shoulder of a giant um, of, at, at what the shape of the law is today. Um, in the area of applied um, analytics to discovery and to um, into this area of litigation, and then also a look over the horizon at what's coming. And I hope that this will be uh, an enriching um, source for researchers here in the Media Lab and, and our colleagues at MIT in the law.mit.edu computational law program as we think about what to research and where the, um, where the uh, trends are going and hard challenges. I also hope that it will be useful to those of you in practice as well. Um, so with that, um, welcome to the MIT Media Lab, Jason. I'm so glad you're here. And please take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Adaza. Um, this fulfills uh, a check on my life checklist. Uh, my father, uh, my late father, was at MIT for 40 years in the aeronautical engineering department. I grew up. Uh, at MIT, uh, and I am just absolutely delighted to be able to do this lecture here at, at Daz's invite. 
I must say for everybody in the MIT community, uh, Jazza talked about being on shoulders of giant. I am not a giant, I'm exactly one smoot in height. And uh -huh. you all know what that means, or you can look it up. Okay, so um, the path to predictive coding in e-discovery search. What we have been trying to do, some of us, in an e-discovery bubble, uh, which is a small part of the legal profession, but hopefully growing, hopefully inflating at, at rapid pace, is to uh, talk about lawyers being smarter, being more analytical, being more quantitative. Uh, what better place than MIT to have um, a lecture uh, that goes along these lines? And so I graduated BU Law School in 1980. When I came out of law school and I worked at the Justice Department, Director of Litigation for the National Archives, uh, my early years as a trial lawyer were uh, years where I basically uh, uh, opened boxes. Uh, discovery in civil litigation in a large case were 100 boxes or maybe 1,000 boxes. Or maybe we would go to a warehouse and a team of us would look at boxes of hard copy documents. Um, there was no digital world of law as such, but if you fast forward through the 1990s with the introduction of the internet, with email, uh, with the web, um, and with the networked world we're in and larger and larger volumes of data, we all live in a digital world and lawyers have needed to adapt to that. Now they've done that um, by admitting that there is this two or three times doubling um, every couple of years of the amount of data in the world, we're going to see an acceleration of that pace given the Internet of Things and having smart devices in all corners of our houses, our cars, our, the world we're in, feeding data which will be evidence in civil litigation from products liability cases to accident cases to employment cases on Facebook, um, looking at data, every kind of social media data, every kind of database is potentially evidence for use in civil litigation. I'm gonna put aside criminal law for this lecture because I've spent my 37 years of practice um, in a civil litigation world. We are essentially in an infinite world. No one, even at MIT, knows the difference viscerally between an exabyte and a petabyte and a yottabyte. We don't live in that world. We can look at the numbers exponentially, but we don't feel it. And lawyers have a difficulty. When you get to be as old as I am and senior lawyers in law firms, they don't know what the difference between 100 boxes and an exabyte of data is. It's just a more, but it's a lot more. And it needs new techniques uh, so that we can search for relevant documents in vast galaxies, in vast spaces that are out there. This is a dinosaur. This is the last time, I hope, that an investigation of 350 billion pages is done by Boolean searches. We're gonna talk about keywords and Boolean searches in a moment, but here, a large number of contract attorneys at low wages uh, were uh, tasked to go look at the results of Boolean searches against a large database to look for hits, to look for relevant documents. We can do better than that. We're smarter than that. And we're going to talk about the path from keywords to new methods of doing it. It's a new reality given all of this data. There's a term I'm going to use today that you all should know. It's called ESI electronically stored information. It was defined in the 2006 Federal Rules of Civil Procedure for the first time. Up till then, from 1934 to 2006, lawyers talked about documents and maybe electronic documents. But now we talk about ESI, because we talk about data in databases. Email is a semi-structured kind of database. Um, there are worlds of data out there, and it's all evidence in lawsuits. So when I talk about ESI, it's all covered. Now, there's a minefield of lawsuits, as I referred to it. Um, part of the uh, world I live in is a world where um, litigation is demanding the preservation of this ESI early. Can't wait a year into a lawsuit. You gotta have a, a conversation with the other side right away about all of the electronic evidence that potentially will yield relevant documents down the road. And so e-discovery has been really, really important. In fact, uh, less than 1% of civil litigation goes to trial. It's all discovery, settlement, dismissals of cases. Courts will impose sanctions if we lose ESI, so we need to preserve it. We need to know how to search it. Uh, with hindsight, sometimes courts will be upset with parties that didn't uh, preserve the information. And they are expecting in an increasingly 
that lawyers understand how to advance search techniques against these databases. They don't want to wait. Courts don't want to wait a year for manual searching through the boxes. They want, they know that there are analytical methods out there, some of them do, and they're imposing that expectation, that higher baseline on parties. Now, how do lawyers approach the search task at eDiscovery? And how is it different than finding a restaurant tonight um, where um, it's going to be very difficult given the crowds for Super Bowl 51 in Boston today? Um, what constitutes the state of the art in e-discovery search and what kind of benchmarking efforts? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the difference between Google searches and the kind of expectations that I'm under in the space. Traditional document review is um, one where we all uh, would be tasked with this kind of box function, folder function, turning pages. It's extremely labor intensive. You get tired, you don't get tired, uh, but people do. And the quality of the coding of relevant versus non-relevant documents when you're doing manual review um, has never been really measured. It was thought to be the gold standard of the profession, but really it was not measured until the kind of research that I was involved with in the last 10 years. So the RAND study um, is a good place to take a look at that. Now, the information retrieval test, searching the haystack, which is just another metaphor for this large universe, to find relevant needles, not just one needle in the haystack, but all the needles. We need to find all the needles that are relevant. So unlike a restaurant that you're searching on Google tonight, um, and you want to find whatever, a, uh, a wonderful French restaurant in Boston or Cambridge. You can type in French restaurant Boston, French restaurant Cambridge. You will get 100,000 hits on Google. They're ranked by popularity. You'll look at the first few pages. If you're really compulsive, you'll look at a few more pages, but you're not gonna look at the entire long tail of hits generated on Google. But my task as a lawyer under Rule 26 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure is to find every relevant document in litigation. So if you have a billion documents, it's not just the first few pages. And by the way, they're not rank ordered like in Google. You go to a corporate database, it's not rank ordered by popularity. They're just documents, they're just emails. And so the question is, how do you find, how do you do a reasonable search in a world where you're expected to be complete and comprehensive? My task is harder. Uh, because I need to find all the relevant needles, and I would like to find just the relevant needles and no others. I don't want to spend my time um, on false positives, and we'll get to that. Um, so email is still the 800-pound gorilla in e-discovery. It is, I understand we've moved past email, especially when we're at the MIT Media Lab here. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the space beyond email, which seems like yesterday's generation, but in the corporate space and the government space, Tremendous numbers of transactions of official messages and corporate messages are done by email. It's a candid medium, and it's still something as a, ben, uh, as, a, as a repository to go search under. Now, I spent my life at the National Archives and before at DOG, uh, DOJ, uh, at email, uh, White House email. In 2002, uh, what arrived on my desk was a stack, a request to produce documents of 1,726 documents. Uh, related to the RICO action, U.S. versus Philip Morris, the, the action against Philip Morris and other companies brought by the Justice Department for a racketeering conspiracy. And those requests to produce, the last one said, all of the other requests uh, the National Archives should uh, uh, consider to be part of its burden to go find documents. So the National Archives run all the presidential libraries. I had to look at paper documents back to Harry Truman. Uh, but we particular were interested, they were interested, the, the defendants in that case, and we then had to search against White House email because Al Gore and Bill Clinton brought that lawsuit. Uh, by, by the way, the lawsuit is still going on. Um, I had to search 20 million Clinton era email records. How did I do it? Well, I did it the same way that lawyers day in the United States still in 2017 um, approached the task. Yeah, dream up keywords. Uh, so I dreamed up some keywords to go search against the database and have archivists and IT people do that. Um, and added some uh, other terms, noisier terms that um, uh, uh, might generate false positives after discussions with the other side and reported back. So what kind of terms? Well, you can see um, on the left side, tobacco, cigarette smoking, tar, nicotine. These are the kind of things that anyone in this audience, anybody who's uh, watching uh, might dream up uh, for uh, doing a keyword search. And then there were other terms that were suggested by um, the defendants. 
The thing about these other terms is that they led to interesting results. Now, I have Julie Andrews on this slide and Al Gore and the Marlboro Man. What I quickly realized is that there's a tremendous amount of false positives in the search space using keywords. Keywords have tremendous limitations. Marlboro, if you type that into the White House email database, you've got a lot of messages about other Marlboro, Maryland, where some people in the D.C. area live. Uh, Philip Morris Institute, PMI didn't generate any emails about that, but it did about presidential. After settlement agreement, medical savings account, uh, metropolitan standard areas, there's different terms that come up. And my favorite was Tobacco Institute when I was asked by defendants to type in TI, what I got was a Spanish preposition and a lot of Julie Andrews references to do, re, mi, pa, so, la, ti, uh, do. And so my world of constructing Boolean searches, which is still being done by Lehman Brothers and by other investigations today, I realized that this is a losing game. This has limitations on it. It doesn't, it's both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. The amount of false positives that are generated are huge and it doesn't get a key document that might not have a keyword. So you start with 20 million, you go to 200,000 hits based on the keywords, you find 100,000 relevant emails after a six month search, you produce 80,000 to the other side, you create a privilege log. The problem is, is that the 200,000 to 20 million doesn't scale when you're up at billions of objects. Here's another way of looking at the process. Um, I'm glad it's all on the screen there. We basically took six months to 25 people to go through 20 million emails to come up with 200,000 hits, have 100,000 documents. This kind of process is done every day in litigation. Note, however, uh, something that I ask my students to try to glom onto in here. Um, if you have 200,000 hits, what happened to the 19,800,000? That's the dark matter you haven't looked at. And today in 2017, based on work that we've done and ex rising expectations of the legal field, now there's a quality control process to go sample against the discard pile, 19 million, 800,000. Back in 2002, I didn't do that. And there are a lot of QC measures that we employ. Okay, so is the world growing? Of course it is. They started with 32 million emails in Clinton. Uh, and the White House uh, kept on their automated system. We're up 200 million in George W. Bush, 300 million in President Obama, plus a lot of other uh, types of media that were recorded. Attachments to those make the volume sizes much, much greater than even what it looks like in terms of the curve here. And as of 2019, the entire government is going to be preserving its emails and all electronic records that are permanent in nature that are going to be transferred to the archives in digital form. There'll be no more paper at the National Archives. So how accessible will these documents be? I'm gonna leave that to the very last thing I say today um, as a sidebar issue that I am attached to. If we actually had to look at a billion documents, a billion emails, manually, it would take 54 years at 50 documents an hour. We can't do manual. Any judge in the country who thinks that manual processes work for these large amounts is crazy. Um, but even if you look at 1%, it's too much, it's too much cost. The 1% of keyword searching that, uh, that was generated to me is too much for the future, and so we need to move on to other methods. Um, and we've been exploring this space for the last decade. Collections are vaster. We're gonna be dozens of times larger in 2020. Maybe my le next lecture at MIT will be then, and we'll come back and we'll see how many yottabytes are in a typical collection. So myth, hype, and reality, I'll do this very fast. Um, that uh, there's a gold standard that thought would be about manual review. Um, there are studies back in, to Blair and Marin that say that lawyers think they do well in keywords that they don't. The information retrieval problem is hard. Um, it is hard in, in trying to parse text. It's harder with audio and video and every form of evidence that lawyers have to deal with. There's a vast field of information retrieval research that exists, but someone had to put it together to sort of marry up PhDs in computer science and lawyers to have a smart conversation. And so um, I've been part of that movement to do it. There's ambiguities in language, I won't go through it, but any term that you could think of as a keyword, you can think of a bag of words that are like it. You can also think of ambiguities of that term. Um, George Bush is fundamentally ambiguous, it's a Bush 41, Bush 43. Any word you pick uh, is going to be filled with ambiguity. There are a lot of difficulties with information retrieval, uh, with keywords as we know it, misspellings, OCR issues per performing uh, not so well. 
abbreviations. The Enron data set has all sorts of codes in it where people talk and code speak. And a priori, you wouldn't know the keywords that are involved. And so that's, those are all issues. Judges started to understand this around 2008. Um, I won't, I'll go past these slides. It's not, uh, it can be read late. Judge Grimm uh, said, hey, keyword searches based on the research going on have limitations. Judge Fasciola said he would, it would be like, well, where uh, angels, uh, truly to go where angels fear to tread to try to dream up keywords in combinations. And Judge Peck, in an important decision, said, hey, basically a wake-up call to the profession, we got to do better. Uh, in, and this adds up 2008. So I hope I've convinced <laughs> you that this approach is flawed. It's still in use today uh, throughout the United States and around the world, but there is a, a alternative um, set of analytic procedures that are out there. How do we efficiently search volumes? How do we improve what's recall and precision? I'm going to get to that in a second. And what alternatives to keyword searching exist and how do we benchmark? Okay, so when I go to bed at night and I'm on a big case involving millions of documents, what I want from my algorithm is to find relevant documents and only relevant documents. I want to be in the top left of this quadrant or the bottom right. I don't want to retrieve anything that is not relevant. I want the algorithm to tell me all the relevant stuff out of the billion document universe. I'll deal with false positives. It's inefficient, but I'll deal with them. I'll go through them. Uh, but what I don't want and what keeps me awake is I don't want a false negative. I don't want documents that are not retrieved. That's a bad thing. Um, so here we have for the computational people at MIT, this, this numerator Greater denominator constitutes advanced thinking in the law. And I trust me that <coughs> judges have problems with denominators. They see two numerators and they're a different size. And they don't look at the denominators. And then they come up with crazy decisions. And I can cite something, but maybe I'll do it offline since this is being taped. Uh, recall, number of relevant documents retrieved over the number of total relevant documents. If you have 10 documents in the universe and you treat five, you're at 50%. Recall, that's okay. It's a measure of accuracy. Precision is the opposite concept. It's the number of relevant documents retrieved out of the total number that you have retrieved. So if you retrieved five documents and you had to go through 100, that's five out of 100. It's a very low rate of precision. You're very inefficient in finding those five documents. But then again, if there were only five documents in the collection, you have 100% recall. Now, one might ask, how do you know? You can do it by sampling. Now, here's, here is a, uh, a set of slides that show um, differences in recall and precision. Here, the universe is the square, the rectangle. The red is the number of, of relevant documents in the universe. The gray circle is the um, uh, search that you've conducted under any algorithm you have. And what it shows is that the recall is about 30%. The search that generated that larger circle got about 30% of the universe of red, uh, the red circle here. But the precision was low because there's a lot of documents outside the red circle that you have to go through. And there's something called the F1 measure, the harmonic mean of recall. That is 12% here. That's not really that great. Um, here is another example where recall precision, uh, well, so you're getting some of the documents, but you're also getting, having to go through a lot of documents. If both numbers are low, the F1 measure is low. Um, where you want is sort of like a lunar eclipse or somewhere but okay, the, the circles come together. You want to search, you want your algorithm to find as many documents that exist that are relevant, but don't give you any false positives, no noise, all signal. Um, here, the recall is very high, 76%. Precision is even higher, 84%, and the harmonic beam comes to 80%. That's where you want to be in the space. Under any method, under any method that can be employed, anything in the black box. At TREK, we studied uh, the NIST TREK program since 1992 was a text retrieval program. In 2006, we um, became uh, part of the project is introducing a legal track by introducing hypothetical complaints, hypothetical um, uh, uh, queries, which are uh, requests to produce. I had lawyers doing Boolean searches against each other. I'll show you an example. And then we use that as a baseline to go look at other methods that were emerging in the space that include various sorts of analytics. 
that now go under the term predictive coding and technology assisted review. And where I started, I wanted to really understand the difference between Boolean and these other methods. Uh, that may not have been the only or the right question to ask, but we used a tobacco settlement uh, universe of documents, 7 million. We used an Enron database. We invited the world's vendors and the world's academics to come play in the sandbox of the track, legal track. The track run for, uh, ran for five years. Um, this is an example of a, a complaint uh, and a request to produce, please produce all documents with high phosphate fertilizers. So I had two lawyers negotiate a Boolean as the baseline to compare about analytic methods that were different. And so one lawyer would suppose some terms with an and and an or and whatever and, and various uh, uh, you know, uh, ways to parse uh, the, the, uh, the string here. Uh, the rejoinder from another lawyer would be, no, you missed some terms and you really need to have additional terms. And then they came to a final query that was a consensus of the two sides. And running that query against a tobacco settlement database produced 3,078 documents. Okay. Uh, what we learned, what we wanted to learn is whether those are the only relevant documents or were there other methods that produced other types of documents. And what we learned in the very first year of the track is something that was startling to the profession, but shouldn't have been because it replicated the Blair Marin study approximately that had been done 25 years earlier, which is that the Boolean searches that had been negotiated by lawyers, they did well on certain topics. There were many, many topics based on the fictional complaints. Um, but there were many other ways to find relevant documents, and the other analytical means uh, that were used, other than Boolean searches, found additional unique documents. And then there was a manual search that found the original documents yourself, too. So another way to look at it is that we found that some topics, well, the, the overall 70% of relevant documents across all of the topics, all of the hypothetical complaints, were found by some other technique other than keywords. So this was a very good quantitative benchmark saying we've got to be smarter in this space. We've got to use other methods uh, that are out there. Uh, some topics, you know, can be a very precise topic where you use a keyword and get all the relevant documents, but many um, uh, were missed. And so we did kind of comparisons and there is a large space of dark matter that is not, you get relevant documents by other analytical methods. Um, I'm going to go past uh, going through these topics because that's not where I want to be on this talk. I want to talk about predictive coding. But for the purposes here, um, we came up with what is tables of what a recall and precision. And the, the rates much higher using certain smart techniques than in the Boolean world. Um, we also found that it's all over the map that the various vendors and academics uh, had very different rates of recall and precision against the term. It's very difficult to uh, do a linear regression here and say that, you know, there's, there's some line or something. It's basically all over the place, which means be very careful. It has to be very smart um, with respect to uh, certain methods used. And then we did other kinds of graphs. You could sort of see here that using a topic authority, an expert along the way to ask questions about relevance increases generally the, um, the, the, um, the accuracy uh, of uh, what is going on, the F1 measure. Uh, also, if you appeal, we have an appeal process of relevance judgments during the time. And the more time, the more appeals and the more time spent on appeals uh, basically generated better um, uh, relevant sets, uh, that is richer relevant sets in, in the collection. So um, all that said, here, I'll go this way. Um, the bottom line on Trek is that beating Boolean is hard work. Um, we know there's dark matter out there in terms of a true number of relevant documents, um, but uh, traditional keyword search doesn't cut it. Um, the 2009 results especially show substantial gains where recall and precision were up at 70%, 80% uh, levels uh, rather than 30 or 40% based on certain techniques used. And so the legal profession waking up around 2008, 2009, to the possibility of other types of searches. There's a large space. I don't have time in this lecture to go through every type of um, model, but I will talk about one black box model here uh, that is particularly interesting in terms of alternatives to keyword searching. Uh, anybody who's interested should go to the, search, uh, the Sedona Conference commentary for a mm, taxonomy of different search methods. Predictive coding, as we now uh, understand it, 
is essentially a clustering of documents. It's using clustering techniques and using uh, iterative process with looking uh, humans in the loop at the front end to look at seed sets or look at an initial or putting in an initial set of documents to then have software look at the entire collection. Now there's a black box element to this. I normally, I very rarely have put the next two slides up in my lectures to lawyers because frankly, and you know who you are out there, um, we all struggle with things like vector space technologies. But um, we will, uh, let's just go, I, I have one additional, one preliminary slide and then we'll get to the two slides here that I was talking about. One is the predictive coding um, defined as a process for prioritizing or coding a collection of electronic documents in a computer system that harnesses human judgment. So on the front end, we're deciding what on a small subset of documents, whether they're relevant or not, and then feeding that into a computer using a black box algorithm um, to generate a ranking scheme of all of the billion documents in the collection um, and using it in a way that is supervised, that is, that is active, that humans are involved in judgment by looking at uh, samples, by, looking, by training the system on the front end, and basically not just letting the software do its thing alone. Um, the, here, here's the first of two slides that I don't usually present, and I would not purport uh, to, to be an expert, uh, one who has to turn to a PhD in information retrieval, but all of you at MIT understand the concept, I think, of a vector space where word in a document is a vector, each word. So if you have a Gettysburg address, you have uh, all of the words in the address as a vector. And the entire dimensional space is one where A1 through A100 is the 100 words that are in that document. And if they're, you know, some words are, are, uh, have greater frequency than others. You basically, the, every algorithm that is out there that has been shown to be uh, doing very, very well in terms of relevance judgments in space is some variation of using a vector space model. So things like latent semantic indexing or probabilistic latent semantic indexing is all based on the idea of term frequency. So you have basic document document similarity. You're looking at a document in all the words, you're looking at another document, another document, and you produce clusters of documents that have um, essentially using cosines between terms, um, the closest in the multi-dimensional space together. That's all I'm gonna say about it because I am sure everyone at MIT um, and many people that are watching would do a better job of explaining it if we had an hour on this. But it is a black box algorithm. And a very interesting issue in the law is whether courts need to be, have this all explained to them in, in evidentiary proceeding, or can they just assume that the black box works if it's producing better results than keywords? We are not also, we are also attuned to all sorts of other methods that can look at metadata in certain ways, so that you look at spikes in conversations between people. You can evaluate data sets by evaluating uh, the vi visually what's going on within the data set. And what's really cool in the legal space is that in e-discovery, there's a multitude of methods being used beyond keywords to find relevant evidence in large data sets. And it's a challenge. Uh, some of these types of methods don't scale very well. So maybe the MIT graduates of the future can find a scalable way to visualize a billion objects rather than 30,000. Um, my good friend Ralph Losey has a, a model for predictive coding. It's basically a workflow process where you do uh, a variety of different types of search methods. You use uh, analytical techniques in an iterative way by training the system and going back um, over and over again to train the system so that it's stable that it's finding relevant documents in a particular way. I'm not gonna talk any more about that. We can uh, point people to, to Ralph's work. Maura Grossman and Gordon Cormack um, wrote what many believe is a seminal article based on the Trek legal track. They wrote it in 2012, saying that technology-assisted review, predictive coding is, uh, can be as accurate or better than human review and is obviously quicker. You obviously can um, you go through a million documents using software in a weekend or a week uh, for the computer to go through it rather than spending six months or a year with a manual process. So computers clearly in the John Henry versus the train example, they're a lot more efficient. The question is, are they more accurate? What Moore and Gordon showed in their paper is that comparing the study 
uh, this is the key graph in their study, which is that uh, looking at their results from Waterloo and looking at other results from a Trek Legal Track in a, a special experiment they performed, the recalled precision rates were better on average than manual review. And with a lot of caveats, uh, their article was pointed to as a step forward in the profession. And Judge Peck, again, I mentioned before, he came out with a decision in 2012, which is a landmark in the law. It's an inflection point, which said that in his court, he will accept what Maureen Gordon found, what the Trek Legal Track found, what a lot of us in research find, uh, have found, that, that technology assisted review using predictive coding and analytical techniques is uh, a valid, reasonable approach to discovery in the space. It's not the last word, and there are lots of open issues in the space, but it is definitely something that he put his tag on. He put a protocol together on supervised learning. He talked about issue tags, which uh, led me to believe that there's a lot of conversation we could have in an information governance space about analytics uh, using issues as a relevant um, measure against collections. And what post uh, De Silva Moore, uh, what we have is two approaches that competed for the last few years um, in people's minds, whether you select for the iteration that's to come, when you train a system, do you just basically let the system pick random documents and so have no bias, human bias attached to it, and, and then from there, looking at the relevant documents the system throws at you, would then find relevant, the algorithm would find relevant documents in your way, you can train the system, or do you put a, a lot of judgment on the front end? Do you throw documents at an algorithm that are already known to be relevant, some could even be privileged, um, but very special documents, and uh, there was debate as to whether bias or accuracy and how those two methods play out. Um, there, as of 2011, when the legal track ended, the question is, should we be using seed sets uh, for training? How, how those seed sets should be worked in terms of random versus judgmental. Should lawyers rely on random sampling or using known relevant documents? That's, that was an animating question. Britain uh, have found uh, more recently, and I will defer to Moore's research in the, one, in the second lecture in the series, which I hope will happen if Daz invites her, is that uh, based on their research and research of others, that a continuous active learning process um, where there's not as much reliance on, and there's no randomness in the method. You basically, software is picking documents to start and you're throwing some documents in at the, at the beginning. But basically, you, know, you do away with training sets or seed sets as such, and you uh, have the software work continuously to throw out, based on its knowledge um, of relevance, uh, a, a, uh, uh, a set of documents that, uh, for, for uh, further examination. What they have found using something called computers, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, uh, a CAL method of uh, continuous active learning, um, is that there is an efficiency here that the, that the lines on the graph go up in terms of recall precision very fast in terms of the number of documents and then level out compared with other methods. And I don't have time to go through it here, but it's a very interesting result. Somewhat, uh, there's still a lot of open issues to explore in the space. Uh, certainly, again, not the last word, because this is a new thing, a new emergent phenomenon, of looking at ways to and to tweak them. And hopefully, the MIT community would be excited about that. I have faith in analytics. Um, I have faith in the black box that um, we know we can do better than keywords, than manual search. Uh, very few judges and lawyers out there are fully comfortable with these kind of techniques. They rely on uh, a vendor community and legal techies to explain what's going on in large extent. Um, the black box is still a mystery, but uh, we are in the early days. We're really in the first decade uh, past the ESI notion that electronic stuff is important. And so we are on a journey for better algorithms in the space. And um, I've been very happy to be part of that. I think to advance the cause is to have communities talk to each other, because we do talk in different languages. And so it's very important that the MIT community and the community of PhDs and computer science and information science have conversations with lawyers about what are the open issues in e-discovery, what kind of methods 
um, would may prove valuable in looking at larger and larger da data sets, which is going to be the rest of the 21st century. And to that end, um, very happy. I spent the last two and a half years um, working on a book called Perspectives on Predictive Coding, um, which is an attempt to corral uh, uh, 30 or so authors to talk about these methods in various contexts, whether it's antitrust or on the defense side of the bar or on the plaintiff side of the bar. Uh, Maura and Gordon have a, an original article in there. Um, and so I would recommend for those uh, people looking at this, uh, check it out. It's an American Bar Association book, and I get no royalties from it. Um, I'm just saying that for uh, the advance of the knowledge. Uh, lastly, the, um, I have been privileged to work on a series of workshops that do try to combine PhD knowledge with lawyer knowledge. And the next one, we've been doing this for 10 years um, around the world, um, and the next one is in London on June 12th uh, as a workshop at the AI and Law Conference known as ICAIL. And what our workshop is on is something that is very close to my heart um, in terms of where I want to spend my next decade or so, uh, which is to use these analytical techniques in ways to open up what I call dark archives. And that's one of the things that's going on here. What we're going to look at at the workshop is how do you use analytics of the type we're talking about, vector space stuff, um, to go into large public record collections like White House email that would otherwise not be open for many, many decades. Um, sub subject except a, maybe a lawsuit or a FOIA request for some of it. How do you open all of that if archivists insist on going through page by page? So look, how do you, and the problem that we found in our space and what's the problem in law and in, on the privacy world of the EU and is that documents are filled with sensitivities. So the workshop is going to be talking about how to filter and extract sensitive information from large collections of documents um, privileged documents, personal documents, um, documents with social security numbers, with medical information, with criminal information, uh, documents with telephone numbers and passport numbers, but have uh, not only strings that are subject to expressions, but uh, contextually that they are personal. And in an archival sense, how do you go into coll vast collections of government records and pull out stuff that is essentially PII, personal identifiable information, free? Um, and so that we can and have access to those large collections. That's what the workshop's going to be on. I invite people who are watching this um, and, of course, in this room to come to London on June 12th and participate uh, and, and, um, and be part of that conversation, which is an ongoing one. Um, the last slide I have here is references. Um, I urge, there's a tremendous amount of work that's been done. Um, uh, we have the book. We have um, article, law reviews that I point people to, um, and the RAND study. The Trek Legal Track, the Sedona Conference is a rich source of information. Um, there are a lot of us who would love to talk to people about these kind of issues. We're excited about it. Um, and so, uh, again, I want to, I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to give this very fast lecture here. Uh, and I will turn it over to the room for questions from Gaza. And uh, please feel free to contact me also if anybody is uh, outside this room. Thanks very much. Um, so any thoughts or questions on, on all that? I'm curious about other kind of database, not just text, but images, audio files, sounds. Have you tried to mine this kind of new database using new techniques such as uh, machine learning or I think, um, yeah. okay, so the question is, is beyond text, there are databases that include all sorts of different other types of digital objects and, um, and images for one, and um, they could be uh, voice messages or video conferencing or whatever. Um, many types of documents have metadata that are associated with them, and we can look at metadata um, for images and for mm, a voice messages, whatever. We can also try uh, numerous techniques. We can certainly, um, there is, there is uh, language software out there that can convert audio messages to text, and then we can go apply it against text. 
And to some extent, we're getting much smarter about other forms of media. The, as I think I said, is that the text issue is still so problematic for lawyers and because all, most of the good stuff that's in litigation, that the gotcha documents are emails and traditional documents and spreadsheets and more traditional stuff than might, you might think. Uh, we're still concentrating on that rich load to find efficient ways to go at it. But you're absolutely right that as the world goes on, we're going to need to figure out analytical techniques against um, all sorts of other types of digital objects. Thank you. I have a question. Um, and <clears throat> it relates to um, during the prep talk that you provided um, when it was with the, um, the data scientist. When I was, the last time I thought deeply about this, I was probably in second year law school um, in a rules of evidence course and trying to understand the concept of relevance and, um, and how that plays out. Uh, it's so subjective what is relevant after all. Um, but on the other hand, you, know, you need to machine that, those criteria in order to, to do really all the scoring and all of the, um, get all the results that we're talking about here. Could you speak a little bit about the state of the art now for expressing relevance, um, you know, computationally, and especially um, the, the subtle aspects where um, you've got, let's say, a plaintiff or a litigant that has a theory of a case. I mean, there's a flat, almost, um, let's say, evenly applied, perhaps, um, kind of a neutral question of you know, whether something's maybe relevant to proving an element, but whether it's um, relevant to uh, maybe very you know, apparently subtle aspect uh, but of, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, something that would be admissible and you know, very generally relevant, but the, because of the way the person's going to be seeking to enter something into evidence or lay a foundation or because of the theory, the things that they want to emphasize to be persuasive some testimony they want to bring out or some, uh, some uh, perspective that they want to emphasize, it may be highly relevant to that. And uh, now we're getting into things that are idiosyncratic to the litigant. H how do you begin to express relevance at the level of, you know, almost like a neutral pro you know, crosswalk of, you know, the law to, to, um, to data in general, and then, and then specifically to the litigants in the case and what they find particularly relevant for maybe even a secret litigation strategy? Okay, well, I'm glad that was an easy one. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, it's always difficult when an MIT computer scientist also has a law degree. Uh, so uh, the issues are subtle, but maybe not as subtle as you would, uh, one would expect after hearing your setup to it which is that um, I do believe that one needs to be a subject matter expert in the particular domain of the law that a lawsuit is in to do a, the, an outstanding job on parsing documents for relevance. So uh, we as lawyers, we all become subject matter experts in a hurry. Um, when I was at the Justice Department, I had to do something on nuclear fission or whatever, you know, I learned that, or statistics in a census adjustment case, or whatever the issue is. We all have to get up to speed very uh, fast, and we use experts uh, to do that. But uh, So there is something to be said for being a subject matter expert and a lawyer that knows the legal processes that you're taking um, the words of a complaint and the words of a request to produce, and with a theory of the case, uh, figuring out what are the relevant documents that are responsive to the, the, the case at hand. Now, the, there's a dimensionality reduction aspect of it. When you negotiate, when you have these requests to produce documents, they tend to be simpler than the entire theory of the case. Give me any and all documents on this test conducted on a certain date. Now, keywords may not, keywords may fail on that, but you and I could probably parse that knowing the complaint and knowing the context of the case to figure out what a relevant document is with respect to um, whether it responds to that query. Mm -hmm. There's a background of context for the whole complaint, and that, uh, that has to be factored into. But I, I do believe that it's not, as, it's not a mysterious process um, at, in the end. It's that people of goodwill um, 
could be trained to be subject matter experts to understand the context of a case and do a pretty good job. Now, having said that, for a long time in the legal profession, we believed that junior lawyers were perfectly capable of coming up with relevant, uh, uh, with, with parsing large collections of boxes or even ESI uh, by themselves and they would put it into piles of relevance and not relevance or privilege and not privilege. And what uh, has been measured as part of the Trek Legal Trek is that something called inter-assessor disagreement. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that uh, as one might think, if you thought about it, is that you put a bunch of lawyers in a room and they will come to different uh, opinions about what's relevant. In fact, um, you may even disagree with yourself um, that you started out two weeks ago saying a document's relevant and now if you know more about the case um, and you've talked to more people or you've learned something, then, uh, that doc uh, then another document which you that are not to be relevant might be relevant or vice versa. Yeah. So there is a dynamic process, but I don't think it's a mysterious one. I think it's one that can be subject to uh, knowledge, to senior lawyers having a theory of a case and informing junior lawyers um, about it. And um, there's a way to control for the error process of having a consensus measure of relevance if you have enough people in a room that are providing those judgments. It's very important for the software to get relevance right because sort of like a Frankenstein monster, the software will do an error to a very large degree. It's trained improperly on a set of documents. And so one needs to get to a consensus relevance position early so that the algorithm is, is essentially doing the right thing subject to um, quality control checks. That's great. And so one of the things, just <clears throat> speaking to my fellow researcher in human dynamics, Let's note the phrase consensus relevance position, like at the start of the tuning of the algorithm, really powerful. Yeah. May I just ask a follow-up? Um, how do you, how in, in your experience when you're on projects, uh, when, when, when you're uh, on cases or, or um, in practice, how, how do people express a consensus relevance um, approach? Like, is it, I mean, when I was in law school, it would have been, unparsable narrative, blah, blah, like in Microsoft Word or paper. Um, how do you do it in a way that is machinable, that's computable and that can set parameters and you know instructions so that the machine will follow? Like, is there a... Well, I, I think we can uh, try to invent the methods of the future here. Um, the, the way that really is done is um, in document shops and in law firms uh, where you have a large number of people who are looking at particular documents, not using necessarily these, anal these fancy analytics, but um, there is a supervisory structure which, uh, which means that there's some training as to the um, context of a lawsuit at the beginning and a review, usually one-on-one, one -on -one, junior, senior, to see whether errors are being made by the individual. You can do that across any number of lawyers or analysts looking at uh, a collection and try to control for uh, patterns of errors and come up with uh, further training for the people involved. That's a human based, you know, that's really a human based method. It's just, it doesn't assume that there's going to be an analytical follow up. Yeah. It becomes very important to um, uh, measure the rate of error rate of various people and to look at what's being done before you train an algorithm because the consequences are much higher. Okay, and so just what I got from what you said was it's fundamentally um, not machinable, but it's based upon whoever the senior attorneys are and, uh, and basically training um, the algorithms by training the people um, and, and basically making judgment calls of what isn't, basically saying like, this is relevant, this is relevant, that is it. The same way, almost very similar to what you would have done in paper um, in, in a certain way. And, yeah. you know, part of what I gleaned from that further, we're always talking about the future of work here and, in law, every time I go to a non-law conference, actually almost every conference, a, a big consternation is, is this gonna get put us out of a job? You know, will the robots be doing much of the processes that are currently our bread and butter um, in litigation and in other professional services? Well, I think that the yeah. answer you just provided and understanding the contours of that, it may hold partly at least, um, like something for the law schools and all others that are training up what's unique about the professional service of law. And, um, and how it is that we interact with what is computational. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 I interrupted. I, I would say, I, I'm a, a great believer that there's some future for lawyers. Um, I hope my daughter goes to law school one day, but, um, and, and there'll be a professional. 
But I must concede that another part of me says that um, sort of as a Bayesian construct, if you're in a set of lawsuits that look a lot like each other, like, um, you know, a big corporation being sued all the time over the same kind of documents, there would be less a need for human judgment on the front end because you've learned the system, the algorithm has already learned on an a priori basis. So you have priors in learning um, as to what's relevant and what's not. You basically have a, a ground truth set based on a prior lawsuit. So that I could see examples where you can use you know, the robot slash software of the future in uh, reducing the task um, and reducing the need for um, human intervention on the front end. However, most lawsuits have enough uniqueness about them that it is worth having some kind of mm, conversation between lawyers and subject matter experts on the front end still. I don't think you know, <coughs> human knowledge as such has all been you know, assimilated in a way that, that uh, software can, can take off from here. But we're, you know, with every passing year, Watson and its equivalents are getting closer to uh, doing things that law students and young lawyers do in terms of research. And, um, you know, we'll see where the future holds. I, I, uh, I have, I'm a great believer in AI. Just try to keep it at bay for the rest of my career. Oh, that's beautiful. Other thoughts? Well, just kind of picking up on that thread, you talked about establishing like a ground truth set. So if you have a set of like, FCPA, like learning, don't you think you can move that right, to like the, what we would say, like the left side of the EDRM and take information governance so you could kind of prevent the litigation and the corporation could catch it internally, like especially with Microsoft making a big move into this space by purchasing Equivia. Um, so now these tools actually exist for corporations. Yes, uh, I think that's a wonderful comment and I'm uh, I must say that I, I feel terrible that I was not the first person uh, today to mention the word information governance um, because I live in that world now on the left side of the EDR model and, and advise clients about what they're doing. I think the smartest corporations in the space can use analytics in, in, in precisely the way that you suggest, which is that they can take a look um, either very early in anticipation of possible lawsuits or as an ongoing basis to look at their large data sets, see what they have, see what might be problematic. Um, I'm not sure the energy is there, the resources are there for most corporations to do that kind of thing, but once there is a hint of a lawsuit, um, a growing trend to use early case assessment to take a look at how vulnerable the the corporation is that if you have knowledge from past lawsuits about what kind of problematic documents you have, that will aid it. And I know that my partner, um, Ben Borden at Drinker Biddle, he has successfully gone in early to convince clients uh, that there are sets of documents that are out there, that you know, settlement is worth being discussed early, um, and, um, and sometimes to exonerate clients uh, that may be under some kind of issue. And so uh, I, I very much support it, and I very much support the idea of using all of these fancy methods across every domain of law. That's what I, we try to do in our own problems. We try to convince lawyers in other places like mergers and acquisitions or employment law to think about using analytics to have greater visibility in the data sets. If the MIT community can uh, help us achieve greater visibility at lesser cost, then this kind of lecture has accomplished something. Could, may I ask you to extrapolate upon that just a little bit? Um, I thought I was done. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then this will be. Oh, so we got. Oh, so we got four or five minute late start. Um, may can do we have uh, whatever consensus um, uh, to go a little later? So what you just said really is at the heart of um, of what we focus on in this computational law program, which is more or less um, applied analytics in business contexts. Um, so um, for example, the systems, uh, enterprise systems that Microsoft sells, that some of which may have just been alluded to, um, uh, how we set them up for contract workflow or um, sizing up risk to get into a new market or all sorts of decision support, you know, everyday stuff um, <clears throat> is really where we live. Um, and it seems to me that the, the, the valuable um, resource and the 
investment that's made in these engines, these analytics engines is applied to you know, subsets of data in the enterprise for litigation purposes could in fact be repurposed um, for um, just for all kinds of business purposes. And um, some of them could just be right directly centered on new revenue and cost containment and risk containment, just fundamental, um, you know, reapplication to other um, purposes. But I think the big news in a legal track would be um, applying them preventatively, which is, I think, the that was really the center of the point of view and the, and the possibility that the um, that the questioner um, was presenting, which is more or less thinking about the life cycle of these cases, where this uh, and um, and utilizing um, these um, methods as part of the regular course of business to maybe flag and identify potential problems, litigation risks, for example, and maybe take um, action up front to remediate or avoid the problem. Um, almost sort of like um, like um, you know we do this with the security a lot when there's some pattern of behavior which maybe even if we don't know why it may be um, correlated to breaches or to other kinds of losses and you know you, you can allocate resources or, or pretty blind in terms of what patches to do or what updates to do or where where we need different kind of crypto or something just based on analyzing patterns of behavior um, when you get good I wonder if we couldn't out of the security and adaptive practices book um, where uh, security teams apply scarce resources based on data um, to the legal track and then prevent litigation or maybe reduce its impact with the same tools what do you think so uh first question is are we still streaming we are but, but we can yeah. if this is off the record we can wrap it up and then have secret session in chambers yeah. Okay. Why don't we um, continue this over pizza? Yeah. Uh, but also, um, if you tell me I'm off, I will tell you um, what to say off the record. Okay. And so let this be a lesson to everybody in TV land why it's so great to be in person um, and where we can have conversations and also form relationships. And I have to say, it's great to um, to now have a relationship with you. I'm welcome to MIT, and I hope that you'll Thank come you. back and, uh, and participate in our programs and continue to educate. And I, I do want to say to the, I'm happy to talk to anyone uh, uh, out there about the question that you asked. Uh, it's a very interesting one, and I've given a talk at Georgetown recently, but um, about uh, the world we're, we're uh, heading in terms of security. Uh, there's, uh, I can't emphasize enough that the kind of issues that I've been talking about uh, apply across all legal domains. And so uh, by all means, uh, we would uh, love to have the MIT community involved in that conversation. Okay, they don't have to ask twice, right? So, um, so we'll be in touch on that. And um, okay. until um, next time, um, thanks uh, for tuning in. Um, find out about the next talk at law.mit.edu. And um, if you have any questions and you weren't able to participate live, go ahead and use the form. And um, it, when we collect a few, I'll send them on to Jason and perhaps some um, we can, this does happen frequently after talks. Um, we can maintain the dialogue asynchronously online. Thanks very much, bye.